Hi, it's Dwyer. Always 1776.com. Also, DwyerCrime.blog. Today is June the 24th, 2024. Let's talk about the fascinating case of Sherry Papini. There is a great show on television. It is called Perfect Wife. It is on Hulu right now about this case, uh, about Sherry Papini's alleged abduction in Redding, California, and her later release. I encourage everyone here to look at that show. Please consider this video to be a companion to that show. Let's talk about it, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now understand, the series on Hulu is a series. It's at least three episodes. Now I'm not a forensic psychologist. I'm simply someone who loves solving puzzles and figuring out personalities. In my opinion, Sherry Papini is a planner. She is rehearsed. She plans a narrative so that her story is presented in a certain way and people come to the conclusions that she wants when the storyline that she has planned reveals itself. So, whether true or not, for months, Again, for months, she tells her close friends that she's an abused wife. She confides to her close friends that her husband, Keith, is possessive, is abusive. She even tells a man that she had an affair with, a Donovan Miskey, who lives in Michigan, that her husband is abusive. In other words, she is creating a narrative for her inner circle. Now, while she has a cell phone, she buys a second phone, a burner phone. She uses it to call an ex-boyfriend, James Reyes, who she tells that she has been abused and needs to leave her husband. She plans this like a movie producer or director. A lot of time, in my opinion, has gone into the planning. The planning is so thorough that Sherry appears to have researched past crimes in the Redding, California area to fit into her grand plan. So a 16-year-old Reading woman named Tara Smith was out for a jog in 1998 and was never seen again. It is believed that she was kidnapped while out on a jog. Sherry herself, in high school, had made up a story for an online blog of being in a fight with Latina women. As Sherry wrote at the time, and this is a direct quote, being white is my family, my roots, my way of life, end quote. And she claimed in this online blog post that fighting these Latina women made her father proud. There is an overtly racist element in Sherry's view of the world. So Sherry goes out jogging. She has two cell phones with her, her regular cell phone and a burner phone that no one other than her ex-boyfriend James Reyes knows she has. He knows because Sherry has called him using that burner phone in the past, and the two have planned to have Rays drive hundreds of miles to pick her up as she jogs. This has all been planned. Importantly, 
in my opinion. And again, I am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. In my opinion, Sherry is a narcissist. She does not care who she hurts. Her life is all about her. She is prepared to leave her two young kids and her husband. Her primary concern is not them. It's all about her. She needs to make it look like she's been abducted. At this point, it is unclear whether she wants to start a new life hundreds of miles away in Southern California, where she ran away to as a younger person for a period of time, right? It's also unclear whether she simply wants the attention that was received by actual kidnap victim, Elizabeth Smart, who survived her kidnapping and is a role model for many survivors. But Sherry makes a mistake. Most of these criminals do. She leaves her smashed phone where she has staged her abduction, but she takes her burner phone with her. Now, if the kidnapper or kidnappers understood that they needed to get rid of Sherry's cell phone so that her location could not be tracked by cell towers. Why would they allow Sherry to keep her burner phone for the several hundred mile trip? Importantly, why would Sherry be out jogging with two cell phones? Most importantly, the cell phone record showed that Sherry had made several calls to her ex-boyfriend James Reyes using the burner phone. When Reyes was ultimately located, and this took some time, and when he was questioned by police, he mentioned the burner phone and how Sherry kept it for the majority of the time that she was at his place in Costa Mesa after the faked abduction. The FBI was then able to pull the phone records. When Sherry reappears a little over three weeks later, she has a story of being abducted by two Latino women, similar to the story that she wrote on a blog in high school. Now let's freeze it right here because to me it's important. Similar to Susan Smith, and Charles Stewart. Sherry's attempt to blame people of color for her fake abduction is factually weak. She can't describe the women's faces. Right, this is a trend in these cases where folks just decide to blame imaginary people of color. She cannot describe the women's faces. She has to claim that the women were wearing masks. Sherry was jogging. There were no valuables to rob. Robbery is not the motive. Sherry is not sexually molested. Sexual assault is not the motive. There is no ransom note or call to the family by the kidnappers. Kidnapping is not the motive. When you abduct someone for several days, in addition to placing yourself at risk of being arrested for kidnapping, especially when the alleged victim is a blonde woman and you are alleged to be two stereotypically tough-looking people of color with no good reason to have this blonde woman in your van, you also have serious expenses. In other words, it's not just the risks of being caught. You have to feed your abductee. 
you have to allow her to use the bathroom. You don't want her taking dumps in your van, do you? You can't easily check into a hotel because people might see you. And it might look odd. What is this blonde woman in jogging clothes doing with these tough-looking people of color? Who, of course, the blonde woman can't describe. Right? You have to keep her hidden. Room service can't see her. You can't just check into a hotel and then you and the other kidnapper go get a bite to eat and leave her in the room. What's the point of the kidnapping exercise if the motive isn't robbery, kidnapping, or sexual assault. Sherry alleged two Latina women abducted me. The story is lacking in motive and is reeking of the kind of racist paranoia that these let me blame people of color stories typically have. So Sherry claims her alleged abductors, who nobody saw, branded her. What would be the purpose of that? Do people really believe that people of color have fantasies about branding white people who might be able to identify them later? Doesn't this racial fantasy of Sherry Papini have a lot of risk for the alleged perpetrators with no apparent payoff? Understand, they grab her, what, did they have the branding equipment with them already? Isn't there a risk involved with grabbing some white woman off the street who's jogging and then going into a Walmart or some other place to buy branding equipment? Do most of the public even know how to buy branding equipment? Wouldn't you stand out? How many branding kits do you believe a typical Walmart sells in a day? Probably very few. Right? I would guess that most criminals would be dissuaded from even thinking about branding because of the risks it would pose in them possibly being caught on tape buying branding equipment. Now, I believe the cops can't say it on the show. But they knew that Sherry's story was fake. Cops don't want to admit that a person's a suspect or a person of interest because at a certain point, that triggers all kinds of constitutional rights, including the possibility of the right to a Miranda warning. Right? These cops wanted Sherry Papini talking. They didn't want her thinking that she was a suspect. But as you watch the docu-series, it is apparent to me that the cops understood that Sherry's story was full of horse manure. So let's talk about the real victim Sherry has set up. When Sherry is first reported missing, many eyes turn to Sherry's husband, Keith. Sherry's friends came forward and told police about Sherry's stories of being an abused wife. So the police suspected her husband Keith of having something to do with her disappearance. He is questioned by police. Let me add too that it's unclear whether Keith ever abused Sherry. I believe viewers need to understand the level of planning that goes into this. I believe Sherry is trying to frame her husband. So let me just say, his story of having a loving marriage does not comport with what Sherry told her friends, who are now speaking with police. Maybe this was Sherry's game 
to publicly humiliate her husband, who, of course, she had already had at least one affair on that we know of, by having the police suspect him of causing her disappearance. Maybe that's the purpose of all of this. Maybe her game is simply to smear Latino women. But understand, it is a game. It is one she has planned long enough to have a burner phone, to have an ex-boyfriend drive hundreds of miles and to have a phony story about Latina women abducting her after she has gone jogging like the 16-year-old Redding woman did who was actually abducted in 1998. I strongly recommend the show Perfect Wife on Hulu because it is a fascinating character study of a narcissist who doesn't care about the people around her. Not her husband, not her kids, not her friends, not the ex-boyfriend who drove hundreds of miles at her request to both pick her up and drop her off before she tells police that he might be involved. Understand, he claims too that she just jumped out the car, didn't even give him advance notice of when she was going to jump out the car to end the kidnapping hoax. Right? Be careful of people like this. The show is now playing on Hulu. It's very well done. They show interviews, some of them police interviews, involving some of the main characters involved. Right, It's clear that there is one psycho, in my opinion, involved. And that's Sherry, who really is a puppet master. That's my take. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.